As we gather, may your spirit work within us. And as we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. Sing that again as we gather. And as we gather, may your spirit work within us. And as we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. 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 You, Father. You know, Lord, it's a given tonight that we're going to be blessed. Because the Bible tells us in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand, our pleasures evermore. We know that. When we come into your presence and we have the sole purpose of just worshiping you, Father, you know, it's, it's a given that we're going to be blessed. But, Father, we're here tonight to bless you. We want you to know, Father, how much we appreciate you, Lord. We want you to know, Father, in our time of worship, how thankful we are for this great salvation. You know, Lord, we look through a glass dimly, and sometimes as the pressures of life come upon us, as, you know, things are, you know, difficult around us, you know, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we're saved. This is as bad as it gets. One of these days, Father, you're going to split the sky, and you're going to come and call our name, and we're going to join you, and we're going to forever be with you, Lord. And all of that is a work of your grace. We don't deserve the least of your blessings. And so tonight, Lord, as we worship you, as we enter in to your courtroom of praise, as we come before your throne, Lord, with thanksgiving, tonight receive, Father, our praise and our worship and, Lord, our gratitude and gratefulness, Lord. We are a thankful people. Lord, I'm thankful tonight, Lord, for the salvation you have given me. I have so much to be thankful for. So, Lord, as we gather... You know, it's interesting. I was just singing that song today, and strangely, is Pastor Doug opens tonight with the same song. As we gather, may your spirit work within us, we pray. As we glorify your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing this evening. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. As we gather... And as we gather, may your spirit work within us. And as we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed. We'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. is 
is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises Hosanna Hosanna Come have your way among us We welcome you here, Lord Jesus Hear the sound of Hearts returning to you. We turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away they're washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us worthy of all our praises Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day in your presence. In your presence, all our fears are washed away when we see you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Let's sing Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, you're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. God, it is so amazing that we can come here tonight into this air-conditioned building, a place, Lord, of comfort and rest but a place, Lord, where we can meet with you. And God, that's what we desire. We welcome you here in our presence. God, we've come to worship you, to lay our lives down at your feet, to hear your voice speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Be glorified, Lord. Blessed be your name, 
In a land that is plentiful Where your streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name When I'm found in the desert place Though I walk through the wilderness Blessed be your name And every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise and when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give. You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that You're my God You're all together love All together All together love Light of the world you step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you 
Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sins upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sins upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together, all together worthy, wonderful to me. Sing that again, Lord, I come. Lord, I come and I confess Bowing here, I find my rest Without you, I fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, 
how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. It's where you are. It's where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Let's stand and sing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Cry out one more time, Lord, I need you. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Not a truer statement could be made. You know, Father, I'm convinced, some may not be, but I am as I study your word and, you know, as I form my eschatology from your word that we're living in the last days. I believe we've rounded the last corner. You know, I remember, Father, back in junior high and running track. Some might not believe I did that, but... But the 440, Lord, I remember Mr. McEntee telling me that when you're around the last corner and you see the finish line before you, take out all the stops, spend and be spent, sprint. And Lord, I feel that in my spirit. But I also feel, Lord, the weariness of the race because it's been a long one. I feel the burn in my muscles, Lord, and I feel my energy waning. And Lord, in the spiritual realm, we know that we can look to you. And we can cry out to you. And as we're sprinting to the finish line, Lord, you can renew our strength. You know, we're living in a time where we're told that spiritual darkness will be prevailing, that the love of many would be waxing cold, that seducing spirits and doctors of demons, there'd be a falling away from the faith. Man, you know, it's amped up, Lord. And uh, it's almost like we need to be super Christians in these last days. We certainly need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be men and women of prayer. We need to be in the Word. And as we worship tonight, Lord, we sensed your presence here. We felt it, Lord. And we felt it so encouragingly speaking to us, saying, you know, in my presence, you know, Christ in you, you in me, there's hope, there's strength, there's sustenance, 
There's everything that you have need of. Oh, may we find that place every day, Lord, of just coming and washing our hearts in your word and, and just, Lord, again, allowing your spirit to encourage us and strengthen us and to hear your sweet voice, Father, whether it be in the inner man or whether it be from your word as we read it, those words of encouragement. You know, there's no greater encouragement than the, in those scriptures where you call us your sons and your daughters. And then John 14, in my Father's house. Oh, what a sweet relationship we have with you, Father. The goodness of the Lord. The grace and the mercy. The peace and the kindness. The ever-present help in a time of need. Lord, I'll confess tonight that I've been going through a difficult time. Just the spiritual warfare in my own mind has been amped up and the enemy's doing all he can to discourage. But tonight I take courage in you, Father. I take courage in you, Lord. My strength and my rock, my high tower, my fortress, my ever-present help in a time of need, my defender and my defense my God and my King. Thank you. And we do that tonight in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Well, spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot. Hey, welcome back. It is. But did it. Okay, if we can find our places, we'll get going tonight. Hey, I want to be uh, sensitive. I want to be sensitive to the children's ministry because they're in the part of the building that has evaporative coolers, and it's 107 degrees today. And so it's pretty humid in the other parts of this building, so we want to settle in and get going. I don't want to go over tonight. Boy, I'll have a lot of ladies upset with me. And uh, I'll just uh, send them to you guys if you don't sit down and say, hey, I tried. Hey, I got a couple of announcements uh, before we open God's Word this evening. Hey, don't forget that family camp is coming up soon. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful time. And please be praying that this heat wave would go away uh, before family camp. And so family camp is also a time that if you haven't been baptized in water yet, um, it might be really refreshing to get in that ice cold creek. And so we're going to have a sign-up on Sunday out in the foyer for those who want to be baptized. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, don't forget to bring pie. 
Yeah. Yeah, pie. To the family camp. Carrot cake. Anything this sweet. Because uh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yes. And John, that was a hint to you. I looked the other direction, but you caught it. Don't forget to bring pie. Hey, and also be in prayer for Pastor Chuck Smith. I don't know how many of you have been keeping up with his condition, but um, I understand that there's five stages of cancer. Is that correct? He's at stage four, and the uh, cancer cells are in the saliva of his lungs now. So it's not long, and he'll go be with Jesus. And, you know, I just can't but think that, you know, the man who really brought back the proper understanding of eschatology for the last 30 some odd years, 40 years in ministry, that he wouldn't get to experience the rapture. And when I look at the things going on in Syria and in Egypt and Israel, I'm thinking, and, and Chuck Smith is winding down, and we hear that Billy Graham's going to have his last crusade in November. Wow. I think time is short. So be praying for him and for his family. Be praying for the Calvary Chapel movement. You know, Papa Chuck is going to be a hard guy to fill his shoes. Amen? Yeah, so be praying for those things. Hey, let's turn our Bibles this evening again to Genesis. We've come as far as chapter 8 tonight, and that's where we'll pick up. I plan on doing 8 and 9, but I'm going to be sensitive to the time. Like I said, it was 107 today in Grass Valley. And the other parts of our building, especially the children's ministry, because the kids can't ever shut their doors, we have evaporative coolers out there, and they're just not doing the job today. You're sitting in a very nice, plush, air-conditioning building here, so we want to we want to make sure that we don't stay too long and, and uh, you, you, you get a puddle of a kid when you take him home. So let's pray, pray and jump right in God's word. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And just there's some rich things before us this evening that we need to pay close attention to, especially, Lord, in the times that we're living in, they can be applied to our lives. Some very rich application tonight, and we want to dig those, those nuggets out tonight as we exeget your word and... So help us to do that, Father. Help us to be sensitive to the time and the people in the children's ministry as well. They do such a wonderful job. And we just thank you for them. And so, Lord, be with Pastor Chuck tonight and with Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. And uh, we pray for him, Lord. And now open our hearts to your word, we would ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, get your pad and pen out tonight. There's some interesting things that are noteworthy that are going on in chapter 7, 8, and on into chapter 9 before we get into the table of nations in a couple of weeks and we unpack that. But there's some things here that are really um, have great application to our own personal walk and our own personal life. Now we've been looking at the flood in chapter 7 and, and tonight in chapter 8 we're going to see the waters residing and some other things going on there. But there's an interesting thing and you, you may have noticed it if you paid attention to it. Did, did the mic just go off? Did the batteries just run dead? Something just happened? Nope, I got a light. Nope. Never mind the man behind the curtain. Did I bump something? Did I touch something? I got... Can you hear me now? Blessed are the flexible. <laughs> what is the saying? They won't be broken? And that's us. We can learn to be flexible. Now can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I'll just stay on this microphone. Should I turn this other one off? Okay. I'll turn it off. We'll fix it later. Where was I at? Oh, there's some interesting things going on. If you've been watching the flow as we've been walking through chapter 7... Oh, you got a ring now. Can you turn it down just a little bit? I'll speak loudly. We got another technician up there. We'll have to edit the tape, get this stuff out of there. You want to try the you want to try the the wireless mic again? 
I got it on now. Working? No. Okay. Something happened up there. Well, I was trying to be time sensitive too. I'm gonna tell those gals back in the children's ministry. Yeah, that's just what it is. Oh. When it works. Oh, is that it? Are you hear me now? No, this, okay, just let's just use this mic. We'll go. Because I don't wanna I don't wanna run over tonight. And I have a tendency to do that. Hey, let's take a look tonight as you get your pad and pen out. Get your pad and pen out. I want you to look at the first verse in chapter seven, the first verse in chapter eight, and the first verse in chapter nine, because they tell a story. Now I find this extremely interesting, and as many times I've, I've taught through the Old Testament, this is the first time I saw this. And I love it when you're studying and you get away from your old notes and God reveals something brand new to you. And I was so excited when I saw that because in chapter 1 of verse 7, as we saw last week, if you'll remember, that the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And in the Hebrew grammatical structure, it is though God is in the ark and he's inviting them into this place of protection, into the place where his presence dwells, a place that will keep them during the midst of the storm. And when they get in there, the hand of God shuts the door and they ride out the storm. So we see God inviting them into this ark of safety. And we know the analogy of that in the New Testament. It's our salvation, is it not? We're invited to come into this place of safety. We're invited to come into this place of protection. We're invited to come into this place where the presence of God dwells, where we can fellowship with Him, we can commune with Him. He will watch over us and He will protect us. Literally in the Hebrew when it says that His hand shut the door, He shut them in and it's the, it's the, it's the imagery as, as though Jesus was wrapping His arms around them. Kind of like what He said to Jerusalem you know, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I tried to gather you together as a mother hen would her chicks, and you would not. And so when we get saved, we're invited into this place of protection. God shuts us in. He wraps his loving arms around us. His grace overshadows us. His presence is with us. Now, although he invited them into the ark, it did not mean that there wasn't going to be a storm. Now, how many of you thought when you got saved, there wasn't going to be a storm? That you thought when you got saved, hey, listen, all struggles are over. I'm saved. God's with me now. My life has turned around for the better. I'm going now in the right direction. In fact, that's what the word met, uh, repentance means in the Greek. It's metanoia. It's to turn around and go the opposite direction. But listen, you have an enemy. And he will make sure that there are storms in your life. And when we came to chapter 8, verse 1, and that's where we'll pick up this evening as we go through chapter 8, it says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing, that, those things that were in the ark. And the word for to remember there in the Hebrew is an interesting word. It means to pay attention to, to look steadfastly toward, and to do it with the intent to keep the promises and covenants that were made to that person. So here's the beautiful picture. God invites Noah, this one that he had found to be righteous, into this place of safety. He shuts him in. He's in with God's presence. He rides out the storm. Now, we know that the ratio of that ark was six to one. We know that main, many major battleships today are, are fashioned after the same ratio because they can withstand violent storms. We've been told by scientists that have duplicated this model and put it in these wave tanks that literally the ark could have stood up on a 90-degree angle and rewrited itself. When God gave instructions to Noah to build this ark, he built it with the dimensions and with the understanding that there was a violent storm coming. Can you but imagine what it was like when the waters of the fountains of deep broke open, the crust of the earth opened up, and these waters came gushing out, and it began to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and, and the thunder and the lightning and the storm that ensued, that ship was tossed. It would have been a very rough ride. 
But God is taking Noah from an old way of living to a new life. And he's with him in it. And his arms of protection are around him through it. And no doubt, as we're going to see tonight in the midst of that storm, as we saw last week, Noah probably cried out, God, where are you? Ever been in a storm and cried that? God, where are you? Have you forsaken me? And then, we're going to read tonight, he was in that ark for a total of 377 days. The first 40 days would have probably been the roughest, but the water we'll see tonight will continue to rise up to the first 150 days. Then for the next five months or so, it calms down and they're just adrift. Ever felt like you were just adrift? That God had abandoned you, wrote out the storm, and now, you know, you're just adrift. You know, where's God? And we're going to see tonight that Noah is trying to seek where God is at because he'll send out a raven, and then three times he sends out a dove. He's trying to inquire of the Lord what's going on outside of this ark. How many times have you prayed, and, and the prayers just don't, don't seem to come back? The raven didn't return. And, and finally, he sends out a dove, and the dove returns. And then he sends out again, and it returns next time, you know, with, with an olive branch in its mouth. And then the third time, it, it doesn't come back because it probably finds dry land. But he's trying to find out what's going on. But the Lord remembered Noah. The Lord looked toward him and passionately fixed his eyes upon him with the intent to fulfill and to keep his covenant relationship with him. And God is a covenant-keeping God. And then when we come to chapter 9, we won't get there tonight, but when we get there next week in chapter 9, notice very carefully that the first verse says, And God blessed Noah. What a beautiful picture. Get in the ark. Come into my presence. I will shut you in and I will protect you. Yeah, you're going to go through a storm. Between here and heaven is going to be a storm. It's going to be a rough ride. But I will get you on the other side of this thing. And when that ark rests, and it's a play on words because Noah's name means rest. When the ark rests on the mountains of Ararat and finally God allowed Noah to go out, it says God blessed Noah. And there's a, there's a, there's a day coming, gang. Uh, there is a time just not too far in our distant future, guys and gals, when the Lord is going to allow this journey to come to an end and we're going to rest on the other side of this thing. And God's going to bid us to come out of that place that he protected us in and there he is going to bless us. What a beautiful picture. Now, when we come to, to chapter 8, we have the last two things that were going on in Noah's life, and I want to draw your attention to that. So if you still have your pad and paper out, write this down. Noah walked with God. When we come back to chapter 6, we understand why God was faithful with Noah, because we read in chapter 6, and just turn there with me for a moment. I want to walk you through the life of Noah, why, why this man found favor in the eyes of God. And these things that we see, these five things that are in the life of Noah, uh, that will be our study tonight as we finish out chapter 8 and, and into the first part of maybe chapter 9. We need to have these things evident in our lives. Amen? Here's what we find in chapter 6, verse 9. And these are the generations of Noah. And Noah was a just man, a perfect man. Uh, the idea is unscathed and without defect. He was a perfect man in his generations. And Noah, get this, walked with God. There was a personal relationship with the intimate God that he served. He walked with God. Noah was a man who walked with the Lord. And notice, nothing else comes to Noah before we read that this was a man who was perfect in all of his generations. This was a man who was a just man. This was a man who walked with God. And the word walked, of course, is in the Hebrew is almost the same as it is in the Greek. It means he had his manner of life. He conducted it the way that he lived, always in the presence of God. He walked with God. There was relationship there. There was intimacy there. There was obedience there. He, you know, he was a man who, who, who lived in the presence of the living God. 
So Noah, first of all, walked with God, and because he walked with God, we read in chapter 6, starting in verse 14, and I'm not going to read it tonight, we've already gone through it, all the way through verse 22, that God called this man, we read it there in verse 14, to build an ark of gopher wood for him, and then he gives the dimensions and all the things that he was required to do. And so because he walked with God, God was able to say to this man, here's the work that I want you to do. And listen, anything that God asks you to do will always come out of a relationship with him. You know, I find it interesting when you go through the pastoral epistles, and we're going to get there soon, that when you see the qualifications for eldership, when you see the qualifications for a pastor, there's only one hint at his ability. Apt to teach. That means to have some ability to communicate the truths of God's word. Some ability. He doesn't have to be a great orator. And the reason why we know that is Paul said of himself, he wasn't. He said, I, I, I don't have the ability to orate with the, the flowery speech of man's wisdom like some people do. But what I come to you is in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. But every other qualification to be one that God uses, that one, that what, one that God can trust with a ministry, one that God would trust with a responsibility and a work to do for him. All of it flows back to that man's character and his relationship with God. You remember when the problem arose in the early church with the Hellenistic, the Greek-speaking widows against the Hebrew-speaking widows, and there was some conflict there, and they came to the apostles and said, listen, you know, we, we got some difficulty going on, you know, what are you going to do about it? And the, those guys being wise pastors said, it's not fitting, it's not right that we would leave prayer and the ministry of the word to go wait on tables. It's not good that we should do that. The most important thing that goes on in church is to be praying for one another and for the leadership to be praying for you and ministering the word to you. But here's what you need to do. Look among yourselves and find seven men full of the Holy Spirit. Men of good reputation and good report. Men that are trustworthy. Men that have that kind of character that we can give them this work to do and that they can do that and we'll remain faithful just to prayer and teaching the word. Notice the qualifications weren't that they were businessmen or they had, you know, BA degrees or MA degrees or that they, you know, that not that they had the wisdom of the world, but that they were men filled with the Holy Spirit. Men of good reputation. And so we see, first of all, in the life of Noah, he was a man who walked with God. And because he was a man who walked with God, God gave him a work to do. And he was faithful because we come to the end of chapter 6, and it says there, and, uh, and thus did Noah according, verse 22, to all that God commanded him, so he did. The third thing we find out about Noah is that Noah was a witness in his generation. Now, I can't but imagine Noah must have drew a huge crowd. I mean, maybe not in the early days. You know, when he's just laying out the, the, the beam, the main beam, what do they call that on a ship, the, the main beam, the keel. You know, it, when, when he's probably laying out the keel, nobody's paying attention. What are you doing? He's putting logs together. The guy's lost his mind. He's, you know. And then as it, the, it's the ribs, the rib parts, what are those called? Yeah, yeah. When, when he starts putting that together and it starts taking shape, I imagine people come around and go, what is that? And then as the planks begin to form and they begin to see the size of it, 450 feet long, you know, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. I mean, people probably start to take notice, especially as it comes toward the end. And so now, listen, he no doubt has is, is got some notoriety, and people are going down. And Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that all the time he banged away on that boat, he was a witness. He was a witness. He was a preacher of righteousness. And he had a warning and he had a message. And the message is, listen, God is going to visit the sins of this world. He's going to judge them. The only salvation is this ark that he's commanded me to build. And you need to hear the message. You need to repent. Because water is going to fall out of the sky as ridiculously 
as that sounds, water's going to fall out of the sky. It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. The fountains of the deep are going to break up. Listen, and God's going to flood this planet. He was a witness. Those are the first three things that we saw as we've come this far in our study, and I don't want those to go out of our notice, you know, as we're just, you know, going through verse by verse. We want to see that. And the last two things we see about Noah, we're going to, Noah, we're going to find out tonight, that Noah waited on God and Noah worshipped God. So here's the five things that ought to be in every believer's life. Every believer that has a relationship with the Lord ought to walk with God, and then as you walk with God, you ought to work for God, And as you work for God, you ought to be a witness to God and who He is to this world. Thirdly, you ought to be one who waits on God. And fourthly, you ought to be, fifthly, you ought to be a worshiper of God. The walk, the work, the witness, the wait, the worship. The five W's. So let's dive into chapter 8 and let's take a look at it. And God remembered Noah and every living thing all the cattle that was with him and, and, and the ark, that God, and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. That means they're beginning to now lower or decline. Now notice carefully the chronology here if you can follow it. And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven, it also was restrained. And so now, listen, the, uh, this violent upheaval has stopped. The fountains have stopped. The rain has stopped. Um, You know, God is making a wind now to blow across this planet to begin to evaporate the water. And the waters return from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. They began to lower. And get this in verse 4. And the ark rested. It's a play on words because Noah's name means rest. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, what significance does the seventh month, the 17th day have? I mean, if you go and study Leviticus chapter 23, the whole of the chapter, there's a lot of things that go on in the seventh month uh, from the first day all the way through the 17th day of the month. A lot of festivals, a lot of celebration, a lot of remembering, a lot of types, a lot of shadows. You know, a lot of analogy takes place there. But on the seventh month, the 17th day, would have been the day that Jesus rose from the dead. The same day the ark rests. Who's our rest? Who gives us rest? Who's our sure foundation? Who's our support? The Bible, when it gives you dates, they're there for a reason. You've got to take note. And on that seventh month, the 17th day of the month, the ark rested there in the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually unto the 10th month. In the 10th uh, month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Now, we get an indication of this about where the ark would set. So if the ark rested and then, you know, a few months later, they begin to see the tops of the mountains of Ararat. If you go to Turkey there around Mount Ararat, you'll notice there's a, there's a lot of mountains around, but there's a main mountain there, Ararat, and it's about 17,000 feet at the top. And there's some photographs that have been taken from satellites and from these survey, you know, spy planes. And, and they can literally see on the top of Mount Ararat, about, about 15,000 feet, this barge-like structure protruding out of this ice pack. And especially in August when the ice begins to recede some, you can actually see this thing. I believe that is, that's the ark. It's up there. The Bible tells us where it's at. It's there. And I think maybe toward the... The last days, it'll be there as a witness. And so it rests, so they begin to see the tops. And it came to pass on the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent forth a raven, an unclean bird. You know, and no doubt the reason why this raven didn't return is he's a carnivore. Uh, Have you ever seen roadkill in the middle of the road? And when you show up, there's, there's these ravens. 
And you know, years ago, before I got married to my wife, and we're going on almost 34 years, me and three of my buddies, we took a, a motorcycle ride back to Yellowstone National Park. We'd always want to do a long road trip, and so we were gone nine days. We get out in Wyoming, and there is nothing in Wyoming. I mean, you come on board a rise, as far as you can see, the road goes straight. And then it kind of goes over another rise, and when you get to that rise, and you go over as far as it can go. And, you know, we had custom bikes, and they had headers on them. And when you get two or three of those bikes together, they start making this droning noise. Whoa, 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 whoa. And it literally will put you to sleep. And I remember having my head resting on the tank and just kind of almost nodding off and thinking, this is crazy. One of us is going to fall off one of these things. So we pulled over, got something cold to drink, and I said, listen, you see all these little groundhogs out there? I mean, they're, they're, they run on eat their buddies. And you see those crows and those seagulls? Hey, let's see who can kick one of those things. So we started playing this game, and we're rolling along, and we stick our foot out. The first guy that goes by, the crow or the, the seagull or the little groundhog would run back out of the way and look, and the next guy coming back because he was looking at the guy that just went by, you can stick your foot out and tea kettle him, man. Boom. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you the story. I'm confessing. I, but we were doing this to stay awake. And I remember all of a sudden I look up and there's blood and feathers coming out from around my, my buddy's bike in front of me. And he had hit one of these. It was either a, a, a dark-complected seagull or it was one of these ravens, these big birds that were out eating the roadkill because it was blood and guts all the way down the side of his bike. Feathers, it was just a big poof. Well, they're carnivores. And so, it, you know, it's out there eating the carcasses, no doubt, that are floating around so it doesn't return. So he sends out this thing, and it's, it's a type of sending out prayer. And, and here's what I want you to see, and, and I, I might be stretching the analogy a little bit tonight. Sometimes we can pray things that aren't right. Would you agree with me? We can ask for things that aren't healthy. Would you agree with me? Um, the Bible says that, you know, when you stand praying, don't waver, because if you waver, don't think you're going to receive anything of the Lord. But also goes on to say, but if you, plan, if you stand praying... For things that you want to consume to your own flesh, don't think you're going to receive anything from the Lord. I think that as he sends these things out, they're a type of prayer. You know, Noah's adrift. He's come through a huge storm. He's trying to figure out, where are you, God? He sends out a raven, and it doesn't come back. And it says, and he went forth to and fro through the waters that were dried upon the earth. And also he sent forth a dove. Now, a dove is a clean bird. You know, I used to dove hunt, and I still do on occasions. But I always want to make sure that if two doves are coming, I shoot both of them. And there's a reason for it. Because they mate for life. They're faithful. And when I found that out, I was brokenhearted. And I just, I had swore off dove hunting until I could be really be a good shot and get them both. See, they both need to go to heaven at the same time. And so he sent forth a clean bird, which is a dove. And it says, to see whether the waters had abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. She returned unto him into the ark from the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her in and pulled her into him into the ark. It's almost like a type of the Holy Spirit, just allowing that thing to come back into you. You know, the prayer goes out and, 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 and you know, you're kind of meditating and it comes back to you. And then it says this. This is the point I want to make. And then it says, and he stayed. So he sent out the raven, and it, and it didn't come back. He sent out the dove, and it did come back. And verse 10 says, and he stayed yet seven days. The word to stay there, and we're going to see it twice in our text tonight, is the word in the Hebrew, to wait with hope. To wait with hope. Now, we have really no concept of what Noah is going through. He's ridden out a violent storm in this ark. No doubt the presence of God is there. There's a peace there. But as this storm abates and as now the waters calm and this man finds himself adrift, 
you know, days turn into weeks, and weeks now are going to be turning into months. And he's just adrift. You know, he's sending out these signals to find out what's going on. It'd be like us praying, Lord, what? The first one doesn't return. The second one does. He's going to send out a third one in a few moments. And it's going to come back, you know, with an olive branch. And then he's going to send out the fourth one, which is a dove. And it won't return. And so he'll know that the waters have receded. Dry land is there. But notice very carefully, and he stayed yet another seven days. And again, he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came to him, this time in the evening, and lo, in her mouth, uh, there was an olive leaf plucked off. Now, someone said, well, how could that be? Well, do you know that you can grow olive branches underwater? They grow. And that's why the universal sign of peace is an olive branch in a dove's mouth. Because it brought peace to Noah. And so this dove returns, and get this, verse 12. And he stayed to wait with hope. He stayed yet another seven days and sent forth a dove, which returned not again unto him. And it came to pass in the 600 and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the face of the earth, and Noah removed the cover of the ark, and he looked out, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Now get this. And in the second month of the seventh and the 20th day, the 27th day of the month, was the earth dry. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth from the ark. Now, I want you to see from the seventh month. So, if, if our months related to their months, and they don't, but let's just use this as an analogy. If in July, you began to send out uh, these things, because you know that the waters are abating. You begin to look for a sign. You're adrift. And from July, you go through August and September and October and November and December and now January, and it is now February. He is in that ark for those many days, sitting there, waiting patiently on the Lord, waiting there with hope that the waters will reside, that the ark will rest, that he will be able to come out, that there will be dry land again, that there will be a life after what he's just experienced. And he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting. And one of the great lessons of Noah's life is, is that this was a man who learned how to wait on the Lord with great hope in his promises. Because God invited him into the ark. God shut him in. God's presence was there. And through the storm, the Bible says, and the Lord remembered Noah. And when the ark rested and Noah came out, the Bible says, and God blessed Noah. Because Noah was a man who walked with God. Noah was a man who worked for God. Noah was a man who witnessed of God to a perverted world. Noah was a man who waited on the Lord. Now, there's a couple verses that, that, that I want to read you tonight because maybe some of you are going through a difficult time and you're finding the most difficult thing to do is to wait. For me, that's the most difficult thing. Uh, riding on a storm is not a difficult thing because there's enough activity going on and it, my attention is drawn to enough different things that, that you know, y usually I don't have a difficulty riding on a storm. It's after the storm is over and the calm comes and you're waiting for direction. How many would agree with me? That's the toughest thing. Waiting for direction. You know, you've been praying, Lord, Lord, Lord. And it doesn't seem like anything's coming back. And the sense or the feeling is you're just adrift. And you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. Well, here we see that Noah waited from the seventh month to the second month of that year until God gave him direction. But he waited patiently with hope because he trusted the Lord. Here's 
two of my favorite Psalms, Psalms 27, verse 14. And if you don't mind flipping there for a moment, I want to look at Psalms 27, verse 14, and Psalms 37, verse 34. Because I tend to have an impatient spirit. Would anybody confess that along with me? Do we not live in a culture where if you don't get your Big Mac in a minute, you get it free? Hey, you remember the days when Denny's was in town and they had the little timer they set there on your table when the, when the waitress would come and take your order? You, you remember those days and she would wind up the little thing and if the bell went off before she brought you your food, you got it free? How many remember those days? I actually got a free meal here in Grass Valley before I lived here at the Denny's. No wonder they went out of business. Because we live in an impatient society. We're involved in a very impatient culture. And the art of waiting is a lost art. Because if we have to wait for just a little time, we begin to doubt that God hears. We begin to wonder if God cares. No wonder when we look at the first verse of chapter 7 and the first verse of chapter 8 and the first verse of chapter 9, God has to tell a story, kind of like an overview before he gets into the details. Listen, I invited you into the ark. I'm going to wrap my loving arms around you. My presence is going to be there. I'm going to protect you. Yeah, you're going to ride out the storm. But know this, I'll never forget you. My eyes are always upon you. The Bible says that the, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayers. And the Lord remembered Noah. He was looking at him, steadfastly gazing upon him with the full intent to be faithful to the promises he made to him. And listen, every promise God's made to you will be fulfilled. Because he's a covenant-keeping God. And there's a day coming when you're going to get on the other side of this thing and the Lord's going to bless you. But it's the waiting that kills us, isn't it? Here's what Psalms 27 says, and they're in two different contexts. The first one is, it says this, wait on the Lord. It's our same word. It means to endure with patience and with steadfast hope. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Don't allow the enemy to lie to you that God has forgotten you, or God doesn't hear you, or God's not concerned about you. Don't allow that, in other words, the psalmist is saying, to enter your heart or into your mind. You wait on the Lord with anticipation and expectation, with hope, with understanding that God is faithful. He's a covenant-keeping God. And those things He's promised to you are yea and amen. But also note that God's timing is not your timing. I want all the blessings and the promises, and I want them yesterday. You know, some of you around here, you pray for patience. And give it to me now. Listen, patience is one of those things that's developed over time through difficulty. But the commandment, and it's an imperative here before us tonight in Psalms 27, in the Hebrew, it's an imperative, wait on the Lord with anticipation, expectation, with fervent hope. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart Wait, I say, on the Lord. There is that admonishment when we're going through difficult times and we come out the other side and it just seems like, you know, we're adrift and God's not speaking just to wait. How many have felt that in the last few years? You know, God, where are you? I've been praying and it just doesn't seem like I'm being, being answered. And I've ridden out a storm, but man, now the calm is here and, and I just don't know if I'm going in the right direction. In fact, I don't even know what direction I'm going in. Wait. Wait upon the Lord. Be of good courage. And then in the second context is Psalms 37, verse 34. Get this. Again, we have the same imperative. Wait on the Lord. And then it says, and keep his ways. Now, listen, sometimes, and we know this in the last days, the Bible says scoffers are going to rise saying, where's the promise of his coming? You know, since our fathers have fallen asleep, all things have continued as they were. Nothing's going to change. Here's another thing that you have to be concerned about when you're waiting. 
The first thing, as we saw there in, in, in chapter 27 of Psalms, is that you have to be careful not to become discouraged, not to allow the enemy to whisper in your ear that God doesn't care, that God doesn't see, that God doesn't hear, because he does all of those things. You know, I think of the time when, when Jesus sent his disciples away in the boat, and as they were going across the sea, you know, literally he went up on the mountain and was, was watching them all the while, and then in the midnight watches, he came walking on the water to them. You are never out of the sight of the living God. So don't ever allow the enemy to tell you that. And don't you ever allow your heart to believe that in the middle of those times where it seems like you're adrift, that God, when God is not really speaking or communicating clearly to you, listen, just wait. Be of good courage. The Lord will strengthen your heart. Just wait, the psalmist would say, on the Lord. And then we have the second admonishment and the context is this wait on the Lord and keep in his ways because sometime as a Christian when you've run the race long and you fought the battle hard and you've done what is right in the eyes of the Lord and you look around and you're going through difficulty and it seems like the righteous are being the unrighteous the wicked are being blessed have you ever had that I was just talking to a lady before the service and she's she's scratching her head going I don't get it I don't understand you know, why, why it seems like the righteous suffer and it seems like the wicked are blessed. You know, I told her, I said, David had the same problem, King David. In fact, he had the same question. In fact, the Bible says that King David went into the house of the Lord to inquire of the Lord about this. And he was not happy. He was upset. And, and, he, and he challenged the Lord. David had that kind of relationship. He said, God, I don't get it. Your people are suffering, and the wicked seem to be being blessed. What's up with that? Paraphrase. And I love the Lord's response. David, would you trade places with them on the day of judgment? Well, no, but. Well, then there's no but. Wait. Wait. There are things today that may not seem to be fair. And it may not seem to be right. And it may not seem to be just or equitable. But there's a day coming when your faithful endurance and consistent waiting with hope will pay off. He says, wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. You know, and I'm thinking of this as Noah's just adrift. Wait, Noah, the water's going to go down. You're going to come out of that ark, and you're going to inherit a brand new earth. Just wait. And then it says this, when the wicked are cut off, you're going to see it. When the wicked are cut off, you're going to see it. And so one of the things that we see here in the life of Noah, he, that he was a man who waited on the Lord. And then finally, in verse 15, God spoke to Noah, saying, now, it's time to go forth. And I will tell you this, there, there's a beginning, and there's a middle, and there's an end to every storm. And there will be a time that God will call you forth. Go forth now, Noah, from the ark, thou, thy wife, thy sons, thy sons wise with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of the flesh, both of the fowls of the air, the cattle, the creeping things that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And no went forth, his sons and his wife and his wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth and uh, after their kind went forth from the ark and get this. Noah was a worshiper. And this, we'll end with this thought. We won't go any further than uh, chapter 8 tonight. But here's what it says. Notice carefully with me. And Noah built an altar. First time in the scripture we have the word altar mentioned. He built an altar. He built an altar unto the Lord. And he took of every clean beast. Obviously he had an understanding of what was required. And of every clean fowl, and he offered burnt offerings on that altar, and the indication is unto the Lord. So he builds an altar, and now he's sacrificing unto the Lord. He's a worshiper. 
And listen, you talk about pure worship. There was nothing defiled. Now, the, the earth had been destroyed. The wickedness had been removed. And now, re- listen, true worship has been restored. And that worship, I want you to get this tonight, that worship flowed from the heart of a man of his three sons and their three wives and his wife of one who had been redeemed and rescued. Listen, man, I've been a Christian for 39 years. And lady, listen, both of you. There's not a day that goes by that I don't stand in awe of what God has done for me. That you redeemed me and you rescued me. Listen, I don't care how bad your life is going and what storms you're riding out or what calm seas you feel like you're adrift on. When you come into this place, you can worship the Lord. Why? Because he redeemed you. Amen. You're saved. This is as bad as it gets for you. You're redeemed. And so he built this altar when he worshiped. Now notice verse 21 carefully. Because this is an analogy of Christ. It says this, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. You know, I looked up those three words, smelled and sweet and savor, and they're interesting. The word to smell in the Hebrew is this, it is to be uh, or to feel relieved. How did that get interpreted as smell? And then I got to thinking about it. How, How many... You know, on not so hot days like we had today, 107 here in Grass Valley, but on those days where it's in the 80s and the spring is just coming and your windows are open and maybe your front door is open, your screen shut, and, and all of a sudden, you know, the neighbor, you know, it fires up the barbecue. Mm. Man, that smells good. There's that kind of like a relaxing. Hmm. A settling, a soothing. That's some of the other words that I read in the Hebrew that, that mean to smell. It means uh, to have this sense of relief. And, and the word for sweet is soothing and appeasing. You know, you smell the barbecue and then pretty soon you smell that tri-tip or that ribeye. The fat of the ribeye. And and it's appeasing. And the savor means a fragrance. When Noah began to offer on that altar, the Lord smelled it. And the Lord said to him, it was a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart. Man, I like that. Get this. I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Watch this carefully. The sacrifice has been made, and because of that sacrifice, what has been removed? The curse. Because I smelled that savor, and it was so satisfying to me, the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. But then he also says this, not because man is not still acting stupid and still not sinning. It says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Listen, he's going to remove the curse, not because man is perfect. What's that speak of? Grace. Unmerited favor. Favor against merit. Not because you deserve it. I'm not removing the curse from your life because you deserve that the curse should be removed from your life. Not because you're living perfectly before me. But I'm removing the curse from your life because I've smelled a sweet savor on an altar. And God would say in his heart, it has so satisfied me that I'll take away the curse. Although you still deserve it, but I'll take away the curse. And then he says this, And neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. There will be no death. The main thing of the curse that was removed is death. Now, if you don't think that Paul didn't pick up on this in his writings, you remember Paul is the one who said that all things that were written in the Old Testament were written for what? 
our learning and for our admonition. Here's what Paul writes, and if you'll just turn there real quickly with me as we continue, uh, conclude our study tonight to Ephesians chapter 5. I believe it's chapter 5, verse 2. Here's what it says. Here's what Ephesians 5, 2 says. Well, let's just back up to, to, to verse, uh, verse 1. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Here, here, here's what Noah is saying as a worshiper. God, I'm going to offer you something on an altar that is going to smell so sweet. The sacrifice is going to have such a savor to it that when you smell it, it will satisfy you. And he offered those, those animals, those blood sacrifices, those clean animals. Not really probably knowing completely seeing it only in imagery that one day God would offer himself upon an altar and the sweet smell and the savor of that sacrifice would remove the curse, it would remove death, and it would bring grace. And that's what Noah is worshiping. And then he makes a promise, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, first time we have the word cold and the first time we have heat in the Bible, first time we have summer and we have winter, first time we have, you know, mentioned about the the seasons and day and night. And and we'll get into that later because it'll mean something because now Noah's coming out to a different world because the world he left did not have seasons. There was a canopy that covered the earth and the dew came up in the morning and watered and now he's coming out to a, a, to a different place. And the idea is that, man, we get on the other side of this thing, it's not gonna be anything like we expect. You know, we get on the other side of this thing, we're gonna find out what eyeballs were made for. We're gonna see in a dimension of light that we've never seen, we're gonna understand what ears are made for. There's gonna be a... a, a, a Paul said, I have not seen and ear hath not heard. It's not entered the heart of man in his wildest imaginations, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But let's just tie it on in our study. We've got a couple minutes. Uh, First thing we want to see as we've been working our way through chapter 7, 8, and as we get into chapter 9, each one of those chapters start with a verse that tells a story. And tonight, what I want you to be reminded of, Peter said, we don't so much need to be taught as to be reminded, and I need to be reminded of this. Maybe you don't, but I do. God, I got in a boat with you 39 years ago. And you shut the door. And you promised to protect me. You promised when I got in there with you, you would take me to the other side. But what I found, Lord, when I got in there, it wasn't the ride I was expecting. I was thinking shuffleboard and buffet. And it was hang on to a beam and and dodge the, the stuff that's flying around in the ark. And it doesn't smell so well. And when I wrote out that storm, I found that there's times in this journey where there's not only a storm, but there's times when you get real quiet. And I cry out to you, and it doesn't seem like you're returning an answer. And in those moments, I have to remember what you said about Noah and the Lord remembered Noah. His eyes were upon him to fulfill his covenant with him. And I know that if I wait patiently, I know that you remember me and one of these days you will bless me. That's the overall picture. And then we look at the life of Noah. What a man. May we be this kind of man. May you ladies be this kind of person. A person who walked with God. A person that worked for God. A person that witnessed the truth of God. A person who waited on the Lord. And a person who worshiped the Lord. And we have so much to worship about. Amen. Why? 
because on an altar 2,000 years ago, God offered himself a sweet-smelling savor. And when God smelled that, he took away the curse and he took away death and he gave me grace. And that grace is to the measure of the gift of Christ and those mercies are new every morning. You ever go to bed at night feeling like a failure? There have been some times where I've gone to bed at night lately thinking, man, Lord, I just, I don't even know how you even put up with me today. And then I wake up in the morning and the first thing I remind myself of today is a new day and your mercies are all brand new. Amen? Amen. Well, read ahead. We'll be in chapter 9 next week. Hey, let's stand as Pastor Doug comes and closes us out in a song. And, and as he's doing that, let's pray. Got you out of here on time. Even with the technical difficulties. God's good. Amen? God is more than good. God is faith, faithful. Amen? He's a covenant-keeping God. Right? That, that His promises is that the, uh, His eyes are upon the righteous. His ears are attending to their prayers. Man, don't ever feel like you're alone in this thing. And, and when He's not answering, it's not because He's not going to answer. The answer is on its way. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Again, the psalmist say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And don't worry about what the wicked are doing. Don't follow their pernicious ways. You wait on the Lord and in due time, he will reward you and you will see the end of the wicked. Wait on the Lord. Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for the encouragement that are in those verses for me. They're for all of us, Lord. No scriptures of any private interpretation is good for all of us, Lord. And I just thank you for all of those truths that are applicable to my life. Help me to put those things into practice, Lord. Help me to be a man who walks with you. Help me to be a man who works for you, Lord. Help me to be a man who witnesses for you. And Lord, more than anything, help me to be a man who waits on you. And help me to be a man who worships you. Because you have redeemed me. You are watching over me. And one of these days, you will bless me. Heaven will be my home. Thank you for all those things in Jesus' name. And all God's kids that say, Amen. Let's worship. Lord, I come and I confess Bowing here, I find my rest Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you Western runs deep your grace is more What grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me Yes, where you are Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I 
need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Yes. You know, as Pastor Doug just kind of continues to play that softly. You know, every head bowed just for a moment. Let's do this. You know, if you're here tonight and you've been struggling, you know, you've been going through some stuff, whether it be a storm or, you know, just that calm where you just really have been crying out to God and it doesn't seem like He's been answering. Maybe you feel like maybe He's forgotten you. If you're here tonight and you felt that way, would you just raise your hand? Because we want to pray for you. Because nothing further could be from the truth. He sees. He's a God that knows. He's a God that cares. He's a compassionate God. Father, many hands went up. You know, mine could go up too. There's been seasons in my life where, you know, I've just cried out. You know, Lord, I wrote out the storm like you told me, but man, where are you, Father? Where are you? And the answer is always right here. I've not left you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But you need to wait. And you need to hope. And you need to trust. Because in due season, I will bless you. Oh, Father, may we, especially in this point of Noah's life, emulate him to the full. A man who waited. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. And this man waited with hope. I know, Lord, the scripture says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And sometimes it does. When the answer doesn't come in the time we think it should come. But Lord, may we know tonight as we leave this place that you are a covenant-keeping God. And all of your promises are yea and amen. And in due season, if we faint not, we will reap the reward. Be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And the Lord blessed Noah. Oh, Father, thank you for that tonight. And the story didn't end with him stuck in a boat adrift somewhere. No, it landed safely. You called him forth and the Lord blessed Noah. Thank you, Father, for those truths tonight. 
Bless these that raise their hand. May you strengthen them, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's kids would say, amen. Amen. If you need special prayer, we'll be right up here in the front to pray for you. Other than that, you are dismissed to fellowship. And you might want to stay in the sanctuary to do that. (laughs) 